Hello, everybody. Welcome to another installment of Club Moffat Talks. Uh, I am your host, instruction librarian Chris DiPanetta of Moffat Library. And I'm Joseph McNeely, and I'm also an instruction librarian here at Moffat. And I'm Ryan Samus, and I'm the associate university um, librarian. Hello. We going... uh oh. See, we talked about this. We 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 always <laughs> accidentally talk over each other. I'm sorry. I was going to segue and. Let you do your thing. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, I'm Dr. Wendy Helmkamp. I'm an assistant professor in counseling at Midwestern State University. Thank you right, for being very here. excited to have you on today. Uh, Dr. Helmkamp, do you prefer Wendy? Whatever you want to call <laughs> me, I'll answer. All right, fun stuff. So usually when we start these things off, we kind of just talk about what we've been doing lately, what we've been interested in and, and taking a look at. So we can humanize ourselves to our listeners. <laughs> uh, why don't you start us off if you'd like to talk about what you've been up to lately? What have I been up to lately? Oh, put her on the spot, Chris. Come on. <laughs> well, uh, I do love binge watching Netflix. Hmm. And I've been watching Firefly Lane, which is a chick flick. So I'm sure y'all probably don't watch that. Um, I've also really been interested in reading about gestalt therapy and how to do creative activities doing therapy with children because I'm about to teach a class on counseling children this summer so I'm trying to make sure I know what I'm going to teach my students and try to get as many creative activities as I can okay. cool all right fun stuff that sounds really interesting uh, I'm kind of hoping that later we can talk a little bit more about that whenever we get into the the main bulk of our content here. Um, anyone else have anything uh, super important they want to jump in with? I'll just say that I am prepping for my fall class by reading about Miyazaki. Ah. Oh, fun stuff. I'm, when did those come out? Are those new? I don't think he heard you, Chris. Well, because so far in the class, I've I've been making broad statements about him. It'd be nice to actually have something to back up those broad statements, maybe. Sure. And are those books recent or have? Because I remember seeing that there were some like art books and like history of Miyazaki very well, recently. He has a lot of art books. These are all analysis type books. Um, let's see. This one is really new. It's 2020. These are collections of in or translated interviews he's done um, throughout his entire career, uh, starting in 1979 up to 2008. Supposedly, there might be a third one of this coming out after his death, probably a third volume mm -hmm. to make it, you know, a three cool. volume thing. You know, um, primary sources, always good. Very cool. Joe, what do you have going on lately? Um, I have actually been doing more reading now. I'm almost completely done with the Witcher series. Um, I'm actually reading the last book now. And uh, then I'm going to start reading through the Dresden books by uh, Butcher. Some of those I've read in the past, but I read them haphazardly. Uh, and not necessarily in chronological order, because I just got whichever one they had at the public library at the time. Uh, so I'm going to start actually going through those sequentially uh, next. And um, we've also been doing the binge watch thing on Netflix and other places. Uh, I uh, Sometimes I come to things late. So I, I discovered a show that existed 10 years ago and I watched the two seasons that exist of uh, Wayward Pines. It's a very weird show. Um, we did just go and see the new Spider-Verse movie. Hmm. Um, and the only thing that I'm going to say about that uh, without spoiling content or anything is that uh, unlike most Marvel movies, it does not have a, an after credits scene. So if you go to see it and the credits start, you can go ahead and leave. I loved that first one. I, I thought it was just a, a such a fun, like literally the watching it was really fun. It, it had such a great visual style. Yeah. <clears throat> um, 
I wanted to, instead of talking about what I'm doing, instead talk about a, a great loss that happened in the literary world yesterday. Um, people passing my office probably heard me shouting things I shouldn't have been shouting so loud at work. Um, we lost a uh, venerated American author Cormac McCarthy yesterday. Um, so the or yesterday, or the day before yesterday, I think it was the day before yesterday, and um. The first thing I did was bought his uh, recent books because I didn't even know they had come out. All I had heard was uh, after like 30 years, Cormac McCarthy finished The Passenger and it's coming out like in a month and it just slipped my mind. So the first thing that I did was went and, and said, well, I obviously I need to, to correct that. Uh, I've read several of his books. I absolutely love him and his writing style. He's just such a... Uh, beautifully written uh works of art by him um and a couple of, of books that i've seen movie adaptations of that i wouldn't even count like uh no country for old men fantastic movie really want to read the book um, looks pretty good oh that's that's great to know because like i haven't watched the road people say the road is a pretty good movie but i'm but i i look at that and say there's absolutely no way it's better than that book um or like Blood Meridian could never be a movie. I'm sure someone will try it one day. Uh, James Franco tried to do a few of his books and they were terrible. Um, but now I'm just, yeah, I'm, I've been devastated pretty much all week about, uh, about Mac McCarthy's passing. So um, I, I just really wanted to talk about that and how, how deeply it's affected me since hearing about it. So we got a lot of his books here at the library. If you haven't checked them out, um, probably don't start with Child of God. But um, yeah, Blood Meridian, The Road. Um, people talk about Sutri a lot. I haven't haven't finished that one. I, I started re uh, listening to the audiobook of that one. Um, please check him out. He's he was one of our greatest American authors ever. Um, and at that, I yield my time. And silence. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, at this point, we're supposed to introduce our guests and talk about the primary topics that we want to discuss. Um, honestly, you can talk about anything you want. This is this is your opportunity to get any information out there you want. If you want to talk about Cormac McCarthy for the next hour, <laughs> we're all here for you. Well, Joe had sent us an uh, an article that that you were featured in. Um, I want to say, was it a month ago? Um, about some of the work that you're doing on campus, and um, I I was really yielding my time because I didn't want I didn't know if Joe wanted to to mention that first. I I think that Wendy can talk about it, but yeah, I the there was campus news about a grant that we were awarded that I believe that you were instrumental in us receiving and uh, what that grant is going to to fund and, and how it's going to affect the campus. Uh, and I think that you're the person that, that can tell us all about that. Okay, so I'm really excited because I wrote a grant. It was my first time I've ever written a grant and I had to do it in less than two weeks because I had a very short deadline and I was waiting for school districts to get back with me, but it was during the holiday break. So nobody was wanting to work, which I understand. But I was like, I need to know if they want to work with me or not. So I approached one school district and they didn't have any high need schools. Mm -hmm. So um, I had to have high need schools for this grant because um, we had to have a certain amount of free and reduced lunch students at the school so that we can have counselors serve these students. So the first district I approached, they didn't have any high need schools, which I guess that's a good problem to have, but I was shocked. So then I approached the second school district and they said that they didn't have enough time to run this through the school board because I was under such a fast deadline. So then I was like, what else should I do? And then just all of a sudden it popped in my head, I should approach Burke Burnett ISD because they are a rural school district and they don't have any counselors in their town to see people privately. So I thought, well, that's that's a great opportunity for me to ask them. And they, thank goodness, said yes. So I had to pair up with a school district, which Burt Burnett ISD partnered with me. And what this purpose of this grant is, 
is to be able to fund 12 clinical mental health counselors or school counselors. And they're gonna go to school and we're gonna pay for their tuition and fees. We're gonna pay for their books. I say we're, the government, the US Department of Education. Um, and then these 12 students during their practicum and internship, they're gonna work in the Burke Burnett High Need Schools, which are IC Evans Elementary, Burke Burnett Middle School, Burke Burnett High School, and the Burke Burnett Alternative School, which is called Gateway. So we're gonna have a student each year um, working with kids in these school districts. And the graduate students are gonna do, they're gonna work for a year doing their practicum and internship in the school district. And they're gonna get a modest salary to do that because they have to quit their jobs. Um, so for two years, they're gonna be trained online because our program's all online and it's KCREP accredited. So for two years, we're gonna train them how to be a counselor. And then the third year is when they're gonna be in the schools doing their practicum and internship. And um, we're gonna give them a salary that third year. We're gonna pay for them to have transportation to the Burke Burnett ISD schools during that third year. We're gonna pay for childcare expenses for that three years if they have any childcare needs because it's hard to you know, um, do online classes if you have toddlers that you have to tend to. So yep. <laughs> Grant is gonna fund childcare. And um, it's also gonna pay for background check fees for these students to be able to go into the schools. It's gonna be, it's gonna pay for testing fees. And we're gonna start our first cohort this fall. So we got to choose four students to start this fall. Then we'll choose four students to start in 2024 and then four students to start in fall 2025. And a big part of this grant is um, it's a five-year grant and it's $1.3 million. And the students really are supposed to be diverse students, if at all possible. So I'm really excited about this opportunity. What is your pool for the students that would be chose for this program? Where, where are you looking at drawing them from? So I went out to Burke Burnett ISD and I talked to teachers because um, to do the school counseling side, you have to be a teacher for two years before you can become a counselor. Um, but we also have a clinical mental health opening too in this program. So I've talked to social work students. I've talked to psychology students at Midwestern State University. And then I've gone out and talked to Burke Burnett ISD teachers as well. So it's not specifically in one uh, discipline or another. It's uh, those who would um, satisfy the the requirements of the grant. Yes, um, this is a three year program, and we're really looking for diversity. We want diverse applicants to apply, um, because you know we need students. Um, to want to talk to their counselors. And the more they can identify with these counselors, the more they look like them, the more they're going to connect with their counselor. So we really want diverse students. We, we need a lot of males. We, there's not a lot of males in our program. Hmm. So that is also something that we're looking for as well. That sounds very fantastic. That's um, Was there a, a specific impetus that kind of sparked this um, this idea for this grant? I think just all the issues that kids are facing, you know, all the safety issues, all the school shootings, all of the mental health issues that kids are having in schools, and there are not enough counselors in schools to help kids with their emotional issues. Oh, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And yeah, um, <clears throat> It, I mean, I've I've heard the story of students who would go in to their uh, their guidance counselor and try to ask them and, and come to them for help, and the the answer is kind of like, well, I can give you personal advice, but that's not what I'm here for. And I mean, it's been 20 years since I've been in school, but um, I, I'd have to imagine that that's still probably not a need that's very highly met. So a lot of times people think, oh, well, my school counselor just does my schedule. Well, no, they have training in mental health issues, and they're also there to address social emotional issues as well. And in this day and age, they need it. Oh, absolutely. So that paperwork can can wait. <laughs> um, 
I teach a lot of generational theory in, in my in classes I do. And I was just wondering, do you see any um, trends with this newest um, batch of, of young people in schools that hasn't been there before or new challenges that are emerging? Well, definitely um, a lot of kids are lacking social skills because they're always on their phones and they don't know how to make eye contact. They don't know how to socialize. I feel like like we did in the olden days. And because, you know, everybody's just stuck on their phone like robots. So I feel like that's also our job as school counselors is teaching social skills and empathy because that screen also takes away empathy as well. And I have to also imagine that in the last few years, we're going to start getting a lot of freshmen who uh, started or were at the very beginning of uh, their high school tenure when COVID hit and therefore spent a lot of their time doing things remotely and then could just continued with those trends. And, and now we kind of want to get back to where we were. And it's it's not really connecting with a lot of people where they're more used to doing pretty much everything online or digitally and having things uh, readily available to them where we want to be able to help them out physically in person and with with actual um, resources that they can touch with their hands that where before we'd say, well, use your phone or use the internet for something that's um, that's harder to get. They had to grow up with, this is the only way to get the, uh, those resources Obviously, now we 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 can't really put that genie back in the bottle, but um, yeah, maybe yeah, I, I can see where that's kind of maybe gone too far in a few places. Yeah, and I think a lot of um, school administrators are having a hard time getting students to come to school now because you know they liked during COVID where they could just do online school. They liked not being able to have to leave their house every day. So I think that's a challenge, even at the college level as well getting people back face to face. I know that there was an article that I read recently about student disconnection that was talking about uh, that aspect about not having the uh, focus maybe that students in, in previous decades have had uh, and uh, and and it was suggesting ways to address that or or, or overcome it. Um, unfortunately, it's been earlier, it's been longer ago than today since I read it. and so I don't really remember what what it suggested you do. but uh, I'm sure that article's out there online um, and, and you should look it up and, and read all about it. Um, but uh, yeah, it was just it was about student disconnection. I'm reminded of the the iRobot series by Isaac Asimov mm. because the second book in that series is called The Naked Sun. It imagines a society where actually meeting people in person is a taboo. Mm. Everything in the society <clears throat> is supposed to be online, and all of those stories were murder mysteries and. The who done it was the guy actually walked over to the guy's house, shot him, and then walked home. And no one could believe that actually took place because nobody actually physically interacts with anyone anymore. And every time I see the kids on their phones, I'm going, Asimov knew a lot more. He predicted a lot more things than people give him credit for. Things have taken a very dark turn. Wendy, I'm sorry. We kind of railroaded you into this exact <laughs> conversation. It was the first thing that um that i had remembered was was joe mentioned this uh this article about the grants so uh please if there was anything else you'd re you would like to talk about here while we have you then please absolutely what do you want to know <laughs> how's your summer been it's been good i hear we're about to hit the 100 temperatures oh yes with high humidity supposedly we're about to hit something a lot worse later today <laughs> I'm kind of kind of nervous about that. The weather's been really bizarre in in Texas recently. Well, um, I'm really... well, this came up earlier today, and I'll ask you as well. Was the spring semester that we just finished kind of strange for you? Because I've heard back from a lot of professors, it was a very difficult semester for them, as far as attendance and student. Um, Student attention. Engagement, and, and, especially. Yeah. 
Hmm. Not for me, but I teach okay. graduate students. Okay. I feel lucky that I teach graduate students, but, um, you know, our classes are mandatory, the ones that they have to come to for Zoom classes, but it's on, it's online. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah okay, I'm just, I'm just wondering. Courses, I was going to, I was just going to say they're taking those courses because they need to, not because. Their mom and dad is forcing them to. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and they're interested. They want to come to class. They enjoy it. They like it. It's something they want to do. Yeah. I'm sorry, Ryan, I cut you off. What were you saying? No, I said, yeah. I mean, <laughs> um, let's see. What else can we talk about? Um, all right. I'm going to go a little, little bit about the fact that um, there are laws being passed in this country that are kind that are basically trying to bring in, in other individuals to, to take up the the school counselor position in a lot of in a lot of elementary schools do you have any opinions on that i'm sure you do um well um like chaplains yeah are yeah people. bringing in the chaplains was what i was thinking of um well i've also heard that some of these chaplains have their counseling license so i think that's great okay. but honestly i know some of my colleagues are upset about that but I just think, you know what, the more people that can be there for kids in this generation, yeah. the better. It is just so important for kids to be able to connect with one caring adult, and it can make a huge impact in their life. I mean, you would just be amazed at how kids will just talk to you and tell you all kinds of things, you know, more than you want to know, if you just give them the opportunity and the outlet to be able to do that and be fully present with them. It's refreshing to hear that because I think a lot of people take a very negative reaction to it. And you are correct. I mean, if you can get more people involved, it's always a good thing. And a lot of times we're talking about very poor rural areas where the, the, the choice is either have a school counselor or not have anyone exactly. at all type of thing. So, hmm. yeah, I know a lot of my colleagues are like, well, they're not even trained for that, you know, but they might be trained for that. You don't know. Um but yeah, I would rather there be somebody there that's a caring adult, a safe, caring adult than no one. And right now, there are so many um, kids on counselors' caseloads that they can't take care of everybody yeah. like they need to. They're overwhelmed. They have twice the kids on their caseload that's recommended by the American School Counselor Association. Oh, I bet that's a that is a really big uh troubling little bit of statistics there yeah like there it's because then i have to think it's not just the fact that you're you have a recommended amount for like your job position requirements it's also because of the mental stress that would have to go in with with helping out human beings that are that are trying to find their way in life and and then yeah you have to kind of come with come at them with that same equal amount of uh empathy yeah, right now they say um, there should be one school counselor for every 250 students, and really it's double or triple that. Wow. And you have to imagine most kids who come in to see a school counselor aren't there to say, hey, everything's going great for me, you know, mm -hmm. so. <clears throat> yeah, and something that Wichita Falls Independent School District has done that I really find encouraging is at the middle schools and at the high schools, they have one position available for a licensed professional counselor. And that person is just there to work with social emotional issues that kids have. So I find that really encouraging. I know that there's a little bit of a, been a recent push for legislation um, ending some diversity and equity programs is that a thing that could have a negative impact on on this program i know that you were looking you you stated that you'd like to have those uh new counselors be from diverse backgrounds um how how could that affect things for for you well, that is a good question because um, a lot of school districts, um, they do struggle with certain issues in schools like the LGBTQIA plus community and those students. Um, for example, I know um, a lot of 
and teachers refuse to call kids the name they want to be called. And then it creates a classroom management issue. And in my mind, it's like, just call them what they want to be called, respect them, and then it's going to make your classroom environment better. Um, but this grant does really push for diversity, and it really wants us to educate our counselors about how to work with LGBTQ population and how to accept them and be there for them. And um, But I know a lot of school districts have difficulty with the, those issues, so I can see where that could be conflicting. Yeah, it's really sad because um, there is a, a, a certain population of the United States that honestly does think America is a monoculture and always has been. And as a historian, I can tell you, it's never been a monoculture. It's never, America's always been diverse. Um, but um, they like to put forward this myth that it was all, you know, it, it was all this, this, this one cultural idea and that is the great melting pot and everyone ad adhered to this great one single idea when there was several different cultures. The deep South was different than Appalachia, which was different than the Midwest, which was different than the far North in this country at the very least. And that's just differences between white people in this country. But we like to believe that it was all one, one culture. When there was, it's always been diverse. I mean, I remember reading, um, for example, um, uh, when I was a history major, reading brochures, um, pamphlets that were written in the 1830s talking about the horrors of immigration because it would allow Swedish and German people to enter the country. It's just, it's it's kind of fascinating to me that the, the counterculture right now is, is almost the same exact counterculture that it was. Like when you go back and look at... Um, like the the comics with an X, um, like the types of stories that were being told with that, and, and the kinds of things that have, I guess, always really defined counterculture has always been stuff like like gender and, and sexuality and diversity and stuff. And at a certain point, you really would think like it's <laughs> what's what's there still to get? Like obviously, these people exist and they're creating wonderful art it's yeah the fact that it's that it's an argument now in colleges and i guess it always kind of has been but the fact that it's like you see the people around you they are all diverse like you'd think that there would be enough people that you would know and be friends with that it, it wouldn't still be like such a such a big arguing point but i guess you know i don't know yeah, I love that one saying of be careful who you hate. It could be someone you love. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. But I love I mean, this. It's grant. not a fantastic idea. But... Right. Um, but I love this grant because it just it honors diversity and it and inclusive practices. And it really wants us professors teaching our students how to do that. And I think it creates a an awesome school environment when you can embrace diversity. And I understand the people who view that as a bad thing, because all you're really doing is saying, we're going to try to give everyone a turn at the wheel. We're going to try to give everyone a time in the spotlight, um, is all you're really saying. We're going to try to give everyone um, to just be polite to, to other people, basically. And the fact that this is a grant kind of also gives me the idea, the, or the impression at least, that it's... Um it's definitely opt-in it's something that you have to want to do like it's it's something that like you would want to be able to identify as as someone who is helping with diversity is helping with um, kids helping with counseling and stuff so i mean is that what you're seeing mostly is just people who are really interested and really wanting to to be open and, and helping with this Yes, and this is actually in our counselor code of ethics that we have to honor diversity and and promote inclusivity. And so it's just part of our ethics. So that's why when um, they're coming down on all the universities, I'm just like, well, it's part of our ethics. It's not like we can just get rid of that. It's part of our well, foundation. Well, I think it's funny also the fact you said, what we're really trying to get is more males because they're, they're underrepresented by our field, so we have a shocking amount of of male librarians in this organization by the way we have a shocking amount of male librarians on the screen right now <laughs> yeah exactly 
um well we've tr we've tried to get some of some of the other librarians here in and they don't want to <laughs> <sighs> yeah yeah we've we, we've had a few staff members specifically say sometimes with expletives in the sentence <laughs> that they had no desire to ever appear on on the podcast um yeah uh, okay, everyone, please please talk for a few minutes because I had a great point that I wanted to ask about and it's totally dropped out of my brain. So now I have to. Uh, well, well, talking uh, about doing things in person and about the fact that, you know, that, you know we're, we're, we're a little hypocritical there because we are um, three people who are actually right next door to each other who are all filming this for our own offices. Um, you want to talk about the fact we might have in the next maybe four or five months, have a podcast pod, Joe? I I can mention it. I don't have or necessarily know all of the details, and I'm not sure how much of it is is allowed to be talked about. I don't I don't know. Okay. Uh, so I'll just say stuff, and and then we can retract. We can always it. cut this part out. You will be editing the, <laughs> the video. Uh, <laughs> a a person uh, in the MSU community has come to us and has stated that they want to donate uh, podcast recording equipment to be housed in the library. The idea being that uh, this would allow uh, students, the campus community, to, to use that equipment to create their own content. Um, and the idea would be that the uh, room would be essentially uh, as accessible as our study pods are. Uh, we're talking about that in order to be able to use the equipment in the room, that uh, people will need to take a like a one day course on how to use everything. Uh, and then the people who have taken that course will be the new list of uh, patrons that ha that that are allowed to use the room, uh, basically just a thing that says that they know what they're doing, you know. Um, but uh, so going forward with that, we've uh, picked a location uh, in the library, and we're looking at the things that have to be done legally and through IT and everything to to actually make that happen. But we're currently looking at uh, an opening date of this October. Um, I will say that the uh, person who is doing this is an amazing, uh, amazing person. Uh, she's uh, very focused, very energetic, very driven. Uh, it's something that I love to see in people because she had this idea, hey, I want to do this thing. And within a week was already talking to the people to move ahead with this uh, idea and get it done. Um, so I'm kind of amazed by her. Um, but I won't say her name yet because I don't know how, how much publicity she wants mm -hmm. to have. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very exciting project. Uh, our university librarian, uh, Courtney and I have been in on discussions with, with this person. And I know that they've already talked to, um, various, uh, persons and entities on campus to help make that happen. It's a very and, modernized. And, 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 and yes, the idea is, is that once it is. Uh, once it is established, at least once, we will re record a, a podcast in there, in which case we actually will all be in the same room together. So That's all I want you to say. You didn't have to go into the detail. You did. <laughs> I'm just saying it might come fall, we might be in the same room together. As yeah, as yeah. And I could have just said that, but <laughs> it's it's kind of a big deal. Um, but like I said, I don't know. I don't know how much should be made okay oh, yeah, it's all it's all up in the air at this point nothing's set in stone so. yeah yeah i like to see things like this 
happening across the university like it, it's it's a very modern kind of facility that i mean even though it's just a single room with some microphones in it it's the kind of thing that you see a lot in college campuses these days i mean we have a the there large are places state that, campuses yeah yeah they have there are places with maker spaces i know some universities have really big gaming lounges and their libraries big collections uh we do have a fantastic gaming lounge on legacy that students in the um in the gaming club can visit i i think it might mostly be used for the esports community but it's like it's state of the art and it looks really really nice um but yeah it's it's always nice to see like okay well we're we're definitely not falling behind in that uh in that area it might be we're kind of coming up to speed with some other aspects but uh, it's better that we have that than not um but the the thing i did want to say though um i think i've mentioned this in a podcast before but i don't know how i forgot that this was what it was was um there is a new element to the uh, american library association code of ethics mm -hmm. um this was added it looks like it was added in 2021 uh, i thought it was a lot more recently than that but then again um, I've had a child since then, so it, time is kind of meaningless and fleeting anymore. Um, the new code of ethics, I think this is the new one that, that was just added. Um, we affirm the inherent dignity and rights of every person. We work to recognize and dismantle systemic and individual biases, biases, biases to confront inequity and oppression, to enhance diversity and inclusion, and to advance racial and social justice in our libraries, communities, profession, and associations through awareness, advocacy, education, collaboration, services, and allocation of resources and spaces. Um, and those are a lot of a lot of those lines. There are kind of like they, you would you would think they were gimmies, but we had to specifically say as libraries and librarians, this is something we firmly believe. And I'll throw in there also something that happened this week as well. Um, the state of Illinois passed a law saying you cannot ban books in the state of Illinois, which I thought was very impressive. Good for as them. a response to various book um, book bannings that are happening in other states, they came out, which doesn't make which makes sense to me because um, ALA, the American Library Association, is centered in Chicago. So, but right. they came out and said that we're adapting the ALA um, rules as far as as far as banning goes. And we're, we're saying it is illegal to ban books in any library in the state of Illinois. Now, before we get too deeply into this, I would like to remind um, you, Ryan and Joe, of our uh, banned books episode that is no longer in existence. Before we get really heated about it again. <laughs> we are librarians, though. This is something that we're very concerned about. Oh, we re-recorded it. We did re-record it because we did get very heated about it, but um we got you were talking buried. about ala codes and stuff like that i was just going to point out that um the state of illinois took um the um uh based on the lobbying of the ala uh passed a law in in, in illinois about about books that's i'm a, sorry wendy it just fun. so happens that this is a very tough week for us <laughs> in, in the profession passionate is good yeah. Means you care. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that we do. We actually we actually had a really big discussion right before this podcast about how um we need to care in different areas um uh, for our instruction. But uh it was just a learning thing. It was uh, I was on one track for what we were gonna do in the fall. Ryan told me, no, we need to go in a different direction for that entirely. But that's just because we care. <laughs> Well, did we want to move on uh, and kind of wrap up? I mean, it's a little bit shorter than most of our videos, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. Well, I, I'd hate to rush you off, but um, yeah, was there uh, anything else? Any kind of Q and A you might have wanted to do? Uh, I know we kind of uh, offered a lot of the cues here, but are there any for us that you would like to talk about? Well, um, in the spring, I'll be asking. Um, new applicants to apply for this grant because we'll be choosing cohort two. So um, I guess I could get you that link to the application oh, when it becomes available. Yeah. Yeah. We'd be happy to Absolutely. put that up. 
I'm just really excited about this opportunity. Yeah, it sounds like a great, a great um, program you're putting together. Yeah, that's very exciting. Yeah, is there anywhere uh, that uh, students or, or users could possibly go to to read more about it? Well, they can um, email Carly Johnston. She's the grant manager. So I'm really excited that I got to um, hire a grant manager to manage all of the details of this. And I think she's going to create some type of website so that students can go out and read about it. But she hasn't done it yet, but she's in the process of it. Of course, that's fantastic. But of course, they can email me or Carly Johnston and we can answer any questions that anybody has. I, I will say just as a point of connection that uh, I I was a graduate of Burke High School and and I would have appreciated knowing that there was a, a counselor there that I could have talked to at the time. Yes, Burke Burnett ISD, they can't wait till we get extra students in the schools to help, which it won't be till, till year three, you know. Yeah. yeah. They were all excited about this grant. I was like, just remember, they won't be in the schools till year three. And they were like, oh, I forgot about that part. So we got to train them first. Sure. It's it's all a learning process. It's all like it's going to happen. Yeah, it's just things don't happen overnight, especially when it comes to academia. But Well, that's a good thing, too. I mean, it, it, it gives a a solidity to it. It gives a a. Um, if you know that it's going to be at least three years, then, you know, you have the security of that fact that it's going to be at least three years. It's not going to be something that's going to go away immediately. Yes. And currently they don't have any counselor at the alternative school at the gateway support student service. So um, they're really excited about that, too, that there's going to be a counselor there working with students individually and with groups of students. And I'm also hoping that a lot of these students will get hired by Burke Burnett ISD at these schools when there are openings, because I know they have difficulty finding counselors to hire. Mm -hmm. I think for a whole year they were missing um, one of the counselors, so they had somebody as a substitute come in and fill that position. So that's another need for this grant. Is that just an issue of the number of um, applicants or maybe the number of people who are taking the necessary um, college work or anything? Or is just, I just, just don't have enough school counselors out there applying. So that's why that's another reason why this grant was formed is to get more counselors out there in the schools. Not only because the students need it, but also because people don't have anyone to hire. Of course, and it's very it's it's a very noble goal. I'm I'm happy to see us doing something like this. And thank you to Burke Burnett ISD for saying yes to me. Thank you, Burke. <laughs> Go Burke. All right. Well, yeah, we're getting on a little bit in the time here. Again, I'm sorry. It seems like we're rushing you off almost, but um, yeah, I think we've covered quite a bit of of what's going on here covered a bunch of what's going on with the the grant and we all got to complain a lot so <laughs> um i'm sure people are, are gonna love that um if you would like to hear us complain even more <laughs> uh please check out the more recent episodes we've done or just come by our office and ask us about what's <laughs> annoying us at the time and i i at the very least could give you a whole laundry list of things uh joe do you want to talk about uh events going on in our community absolutely it, yeah I, I I have the sheet. Um, I, I I will I will say that here in the library we are working on a book shifting project. It's about it's it's almost two thirds the library that's being shifted at this point. We're we're just moving the entire second and and first floor. That's all. Uh, <laughs> but 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 part of part of the end goal there uh, will result in uh, our youth literature collection, what we call our CML, is going to be moved from the second floor to the first floor. Uh, but it's more of a centralization type yes. thing. So all so the subject um, collections, collections be, will be all in one place yeah. and all the main books will be in a different place rather than scattered around like they are now. 
And our In DVDs are that, not going anywhere. Uh, the uh, Wichita Falls Public Library has Storybook Yoga on Monday mornings at 1030. And they'll be hosting uh, Maker Monday at 430 every week of June and July. Uh, the Wichita Theater's Stage 2 is performing Agatha Christie's Murder on the Nile. The next After Hours Art Walk will be downtown in Wichita Falls on July 6th. A couple of interesting things happening uh, at the WFMA uh, here at MSU uh, in July and then in August. Uh, July 6th and July 8th, they're doing a cut paper workshop where participants will make uh, collages and the workshop is free and all the materials are provided. And I actually only just learned about this today, and I'm so excited about it. Uh, they're going to be doing a Lego printing workshop in August on August 10th and August 19th. Uh, participants will make and use Lego pieces and ink to make relief prints. Uh, that workshop is also free and the materials are provided. Uh, you can contact the museum at uh, extension 8900 for more information on that. Uh, and uh, this, we'll have more information on this as we get a little closer, but go ahead and start making plans now to attend our October event, Rooftop Heroes and Tabletop Terrors. Uh, for information, more information about those and other activities, you can check out the uh, events section of the MSU homepage or the calendar at discoverwichitafalls.com slash events. And if you have things that you want us to mention, or if you have comments or complaints or suggestions, just drop us a line. Library. Um, if you want to see Texas pictures of, of Chris's um, daughter, he'll be glad to show you pictures of his daughter. Yes. Oh, God. Literally had to get a new hard drive. <laughs> She's do, she does a new thing now where she uh where when we're when she's taking a bath she'll just lay completely flat on her stomach and sometimes she'll drink the bath water and I'll tell her that's really disgusting you need to stop that and then she'll look at me and go meh I'm like all right fine whatever you do what you want how old is she she turned seventeen months on the fourth. So she'll be a year and a half uh, the on the 4th of July. Um, and then we were going to get our gender reveal for our second one this weekend, but um, the weather in Texas has become apocalyptic lately. Um, my in-laws had their breaker box torn off their house. Uh, and that's usually where we stay at uh, whenever we go back to East Texas. So we decided let's just hold it off for uh, for another week or so. Um but yeah, so we never we never thought we'd be a two under two family, but so we have our second coming up. Due date is in December. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm not stressed at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so for any of those events that uh, Joe mentioned, and the, the Museum of Art is the one that's right across the street from the yes. campus, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, my wife and I went to a lot of those, um, gosh, a few years back. And yeah, they are just, they're wonderful. The people there are so passionate about teaching their, their arts and their crafts. They're more than willing to just sit by and help you out with, with any of the projects they've got going on. Yeah. We, we love doing those. So yeah, if, if any of that sounds interesting to you, then absolutely would wholeheartedly recommend, uh, doing the, the art programs. And this has been Club Moffat Talks. That's it. That's it. Uh, thank you so much, Wendy, for joining us. That was uh, it was just such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for having me. And from all of us here, we'll see you on the next one. Bye.